Hello there, and welcome back to the Agostino Zynga Show, episode number 325. I'm going to say it again, episode number 325. How are you guys doing? How are you guys feeling? Amazing. Great. Good to hear. How am I? Pretty good, man. I'm in a good space. Um, it's now sometime in the morning. I'm going to say it's about 6 a.m. now, Monday morning. So wherever you are, good morning to you, or good afternoon, or good evening, whenever you get to wake up. I know some of you are furloughed, some of you are unemployed, some of you are just coasting through life, you know, um, enjoying it, you know, fucking, what are you doing, skipping stones on a nice open sea somewhere, wherever you may be, thank you so much for joining me right now in these crazy times that we live in, I don't take it for granted whatsoever, as per usual, if this is your first time listening to this show, make sure that you share it, like it, all that good stuff with your mates and your friends, if you're viewing this via YouTube, then of course, smash that like button, hit subscribe, of course, come back for another time. And why not leave me a comment and let me know what you think of the show. <clears throat> but apart from that, I've got no more requests of you. No more ask, no more wants. I'm just your humble podcasting servant here to give you the news as I see it. <laughs> That's me. But yeah, well, what's new in my life? Nothing much really, apart from I've got this new microphone stand. for a desktop but it's gonna let me hold it so i don't have to keep holding the actual thing so it doesn't make any much too much noise because as great as this podcast is it's not the best thing to hold in your hand maybe it'd be quite good if somebody made a some sort of a adapter that you could hold some sort of thing you could put at the bottom of it so you could hold it like a normal mic that'd be pretty cool but it's a pretty decent one isn't it so far my audio levels have been super good um i'm happy with how i'm sounding i'm sounding very crisp very fresh and i've even got this pop mic on the or this pop shield on the top of it so imagine how loud or how much clearer i would sound without it but i think this little shield gives it a little bit more protection so i stop with the but yeah the, the mic sounds new uh the other thing that's new as you can probably tell i've got my sennheiser hd 25s back again this is pro quite possibly my i might say my fourth pair right so th these are the 70 what the 75th anniversary edition I think so, right? Celebrating 75 years, is it 70? Or 70, I don't know, one of them anyway. It's an anniversary edition of the Sennheiser HD25s, the archetypal DJ DJ's headphone. Um, They've got the little yellow ear pads there as a nod to the old headphones they did back in the day, which I think were the 114s or something like that. Um, You know, typical standard HD25, really light uh, unit overall. Um, everything here is replaceable from the pads to the cables to the cups. You can replace them and change them. My previous pair I had, whoever's got them out there, you're a lucky bastard. The previous pair I had were black with a see-through cable. So if you've got those, then you're happy because I lost them somewhere or I might have chucked them in the bin accidentally. So you can get a little see-through cable or cables differently on the, you can get different cables on them, sorry. And then at the end, you could have them be a bit spiraled so they don't have to get tangled up. But I'm happy with these, you know, I've returned to the best. They're, they were they were a promotion offer, so they came out to about 90 quid. Again, I think they're celebrating 75 years. I'm going to say that. I think 75 years. So they put these special edition ones out. Typical, you know, just standard. Exactly the same as the normal ones you get in the store, as the inline ones, but just have the additional um, different cups. And then I think they've got a different sort of iconography here on the band. I'm pretty sure it's a bit different to the original ones I had. I'm not too sure. But yeah, apart from that. Oh, and they do come with the replaceable black pads as well that I might start using. But I'm starting to like the yellow pads. At first, I thought it was a bit naff, but I'm starting to like them. The more and more I've started to read into the reason why they went into using them and checking out some of the old vintage pairs. I'm quite enjoying having the little yellow ear pads, something a bit different. But yeah, those are the headphones I've got. And they're staples, man, you know, in the... Just in terms of if you're a bit of an audio file and you like your you like how your stuff sounds with a bit of extra bass, these are the best way to go with the best thing to go for. But I think if especially if you're a DJ or you aspire to be one, it's good to have like your bass it, it's good to have the fundamental bits of equipment be the industry standards. And this is one of them. I'm a big believer in that. If you want to, you know, get started, make sure you have them. If you have the if you're gonna get a controller, get the best in class. If you're gonna get a headphone, get a best in class. And then the rest of the stuff, you can possibly get away with having, you know, some shitty things here and there. You could possibly get away with having not the best monitors, 
Um, you could probably get, you probably even get away with having, um, you know, mediocre or entry level cables just to go with your units. You know what I mean? And then you can start upgrading bit by bit as you progress. I think that's the major important thing I've learned over the years is don't get hung up on equipment. Don't think because you've got a pair of shitty Amazon headphones that you can't go and DJ somewhere. You can. The most important thing is just to get the fundamentals there correct, right? Making sure you know the beat match. Um, or whatever it may be or how to cue your music up in the first place what to hear what to listen or hear for when you are preparing yourself on record box and then as you progress you might want these because you know you have the advantage of especially with the other sony headphones or normal headphones i think most headphones have, have this thing if you've got a monitor headphone where the actual cable the output cable here it's on one side so you don't have the annoyance of having both cables. you know normal headphones you have both cables coming out from both cups you have them only on one side, so when you take them off your head, it's a little bit easier. You don't, it doesn't have that strangling effect on you. You've also got the the the, uh, the fact that these cups are all retractable, right? As you can tell there, you can also spin one of them backwards to kind of keep it away from your ear to give you a little bit, um, to give your ears a bit of a breather. So, and then of course you've got the benefit of kind of like splitting the headband here. So it can fit your massive chrome a bit easier. So I've got a bit of a big head, so that kind of helps. So you get these added advantages, but at the end of the day, they're still just headphones. Isn't it? So if you don't need them, don't get them. But if you are looking for a pair of staple headphones to use during your DJ sets, I recommend you get them. They're the best in class out there. Um, there's a few other brands I was looking at. Um, there's the brand called Fonon. It's a freaking Japanese um it's a little japanese brand that dixon uses and a few other people and they've got as a headphone that's probably a similar looking to like an an iii have you pronounced that is it aaa or ai after you pronounce that name of that brand but similar to that kind of look where it's sort of got like a flat cup um the band is a little bit thicker and then it's got like a little metallic plate on the side of it so it looks really really clean i recommend you check those out if you're curious about it let me actually get them up here on the screen so you guys can see let me put this down here put my headphones back on let me show you if i can show you where that headphone is it's like a phone on something right phone on there we go phone on four four get them up here if you guys see the d d d d images yes yeah, this one so number two so i think they're about 250 pounds so if you want something probably a step above what i've got at the moment and you know maybe something a little bit more unique than what everyone else is wearing now on the, in the dj booth then definitely check these out phone on four four zero zero really really nice headphones here yeah, about 300 euros here on this side but they look incredible and of course this is the the version from dixon's store label muting the noise so yeah and then uh, so the I'm, I'm guessing the ear, the cups the ear bits whatever they're called they spin around which makes them easier to transport um and then of course you got the advantage of just being able to spin them around and hold them upside down and you know cue that way but yeah really cool headphones that are out there available at the moment so loads of great options and of course you've always got the you know again you've always got the option of just picking up a little cheap regular pair from sony on amazon like i did to begin with and then working your way up you know there's no rush with these kind of things but yeah some good stuff there anyway what else has been happening oh over the weekend a group of uh a group of skinheads decided what do you call them skinheads no let's not call them skinheads they, they don't even deserve that kind of recognition let's call them football hooligans isn't it uh, football hooligans masquerading as protesters decided to descend onto london in an effort to defend the statues that were boarded up right <laughs> it's a quite a preposterous story isn't it really to be honest let me see if i can get it up so i guess the weekend before last um all the most of the london protesters that were going around were you know pretty peaceful everything kind of went um pretty smoothly people went out there voiced their opinions rallied mobilized encouraged each other all that good stuff but then there was a small minority of people who also got the chance to take it upon themselves to you know um deface or in the case of what happened in bristol uh topple statues that they felt as if had kind of you know went past their sell by date you know statues that commemorated um some 
icons within English history who also had checkered past, right? People who were essentially um, the some of the mainstays of the slave trade back in the days. Um, I never just really understood that anyway in the first place, why you'd have a statue commemorate somebody who was responsible for the slave trade, right? Who played any part in it whatsoever. It would be one of those things that would kind of be like a bit of a an embarrassing moment in history for you, I guess. Um, there are obviously those people on the right, conservatives for the most part, who are like, you know, taking out our statues is also trying to attempt to, you know, erase our history, which is totally ridiculous. You know, the, there are no statues erected of Genghis Khan, but we know he existed, it? but we don't need his statue being erected in the middle of fucking, you know, Tiananmen Square. Doesn't make any sense. Um, you can read up about these people. Huh? History doesn't disappear because you de deface a statue. And um, if anything, it kind of solidifies its place in history because of that event itself. But, you know, I guess people are sticklers for tradition. It is what it is. Let me see here. Statues. Ba, 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 ba. In the church of Saint maybe I've put in the museum. Let's see. Statues and protest so this happened so this is like a little timeline of the events right this happened last week uh, clashes heard of glasgow police statue where is it come on okay there you go ba, 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 ba. So this is an article from the BBC. This happened last week. Just to give you like a context of the events, right? So it says George Floyd protests, the statues being defaced. Hmm. It says when anti-racism protests in England uh, pulled down the statue of 17th century slave trader and promptly dumped him in the deep waters of the harbour, the message was clear. Edward Colston's ships were believed to have transported 80,000 men and women and children from Africa to the Americas. Bloody hell. But his memory has been honoured uh, for centuries um, in his home of city of Bristol, uh, which benefited from vast wealth. While the governments condemned the act on Sunday, protesters said they hoped it signified change. Statues are about saying this was a great man who did great things. That is not true. He was a slave trader and a murderer, historian David Olusugus told BBC News. Global protests like the one in Bristol have shed a light on the city's colonial slave history, slave owning history and the figures represent it. And the interesting thing is when you actually speak to, I think I've seen some videos of people that are, that are from Bristol who have said basically they've always had a bit of a contentious relationship with the statue of Edward Corson anyway. I've never actually seen it when I've been to Bristol, to be completely honest. Most of the time when I go there, it's usually, you know, on a bit of a tear up, go and visit all the amazing pubs and bars and restaurants they have there. But it's not this isn't something that just come out of the blue they've always had a bit of a contentious relationship with it i think they put together a petition to tear down the statue that was you know of course ignored like most petitions are but there was this conversation happening and sometimes i think the good thing about protests is that they do bring about change in that i'm still a big believer that without the video of george floyd dying and without the protests on the streets we probably wouldn't have seen those police officers fired number one that's a big thing because Police officers getting fired in America is is a pretty recent thing, right? Getting actually fired from their job, not put on leave, um, you know, with full pay pending an investigation, completely just, you know, fired and every bit of communication they've put out has been like, you know, former Minneapolis police officer, not current police officer or whatever it may be. Um, so I don't think without those videos and protests you get police officers fired and also don't think you get them charged with let alone murder, you yeah? know? it's not going to happen right mansell or maybe right? murder is fucking insane so the protesters the protests do actually work and i think part of the reason why they do work is that people um you kind of push the narrative you push change you kind of give the pro the government no other solution you kind of back them into a corner so when you dump a statue of edward colston into the river um you give the politicians no real recourse because if they pull it back out and pull it back onto the for whatever it is that's going to be a real real nail in the coffin of their you know of their run as mp or whatever it may be and if there's one thing we know about politicians once they get that bit of power or they get that bit of responsibility they don't want to let it go so they're gonna mean they're gonna do as much as they can to kind of maintain their level of influence or it's not, it's not the status quo but their position right they're not gonna let that thing go so that's the good thing i like about these protests
Um, we've got here about Henry Douglas as a monument on the Scottish capital, Edinburgh, commemorating partition who delayed the abolition of slavery, has been spray painted with the words George Floyd and BLM for Black Lives Matter. The 150 foot tall Melville Monument in Edinburgh's tire, St Andrew's Square, was erected in 1823 in memory of Henry Dundas. Again, really bizarre, isn't it? Somebody you know, delays the abolition of slavery, but then gets a statue. Interesting. So Dundas was one of the country's most influential politicians in the 18th and 19th century. That's probably explains why he's got a statue then, apart from the slavery, and had a nickname, the Uncrowned King. He put forward an amendment to the bill, which has been abolished slavery in 1792, opting for a more gradual approach. This allowed the practice to continue for 15 years longer than the otherwise has been done. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Thousands of people have signed petitions calling for the monument to be taken down amid protests over the monument officials have announced that the plaque will be added to offering a reflective details about the city's links to slavery we need to tell our story and make sure that people understand edinburgh's role in the world of historically not just the bits we're proud of but frankly the bits we're ashamed of as well said um edinburgh city council adam mcveigh told bbc because you know this kind of reminds me of do you remember that um episode of black mirror where there's like a museum of slavery and that girl goes to go visit it. That kind of reminds me of that. I wonder why they just, just don't have that, like, um, you know, embarrassing parts of our history. I don't know, kind of section in the National Museum. Maybe, I guess there's some leftists who are like, they want to know where to stop. Because I think the place where you stop is that, like, okay, let's not have these statues erected of, you know, deplorable human beings, right? That's probably not the best message to send out there, right? You want to probably encourage good behavior, um, to your citizens and also to people in power right you want to kind of give them because you know you want to give people an incentive to do good things right that's probably uh, a good way to go about things so if you have statues of actually of people that are commendable people that have honor people that have morals it might re it might in a roundabout way um, make for a more honest politician you could hope so right that could that's obviously going to be the hope but you'd also You'd also want to have a place where people could go and be reminded, have like a, you know, sort of like when you go to the Auschwitz Memorial in Berlin or people that actually go on these tours and visit the actual, you know, the places where they used to have the concentration camps, right? Um, there's something quite sobering if you're, I guess, if you're Hasidic, if you're a Jew or if you're just a person in history, a person you want to just to get more in touch with your history, to go to these kind of places and be reminded of the terror that happened there right to be reminded of the lack of humanity that was placed on those people so that you know when you go back to your regular everyday life you are more thankful for what you have right more appreciative position that you have in life even though you have don't might have that much you're thankful that you weren't born in that era why don't we have that for statues why don't we have that to commemorate you know ugly parts of our history in the country just bits in the, in the in the museum that kind of commemorates it. I guess for some leftists, like I mentioned, for them it wouldn't be enough. If you take the statues down and put them in a museum, I'm sure some would protest and say they don't even need to be in a museum. Put them in a book. You put them in a book. People would argue that they should be burned. Right? It, there's no amount of stop. But I think as a good compromise, to compromise with the conservatives who are hell bent on showing the ugly parts of our history, and to also compromise people who don't want the statues to be erected in the middle of nowhere, right? Because I'm, because for sure, tourists take pictures of this with their statue, right, of Edward Colston and have no idea who he was. They just, you know, you go to, and I guess that's probably why they get erected in the first place, right? They're sort of like a quasi tourist attraction. People can just stand next to them and take pictures and do that weird thing where they point up. That might be part of it, but um, I'm glad they've gone anyway. That was it, right? So the, the people are protesting, people get angry. As a reaction to that, all the football hooligans decided to come out th this past weekend and sort of like defend the statue's honour. Um, case in point being the Winston Churchill statue that was erect that, that's in the middle of London as well. Um, so in response, the UK government decided to board it up in a way that I've never seen a statue boarded up in my entire life. They kind of covered the entire thing in this sort of um in this sort of uh, is it i don't want to say it's metal i don't know if it's metal or if it's just like a board thing to make sure no one could touch it and they also had a security guard standing outside of it which is flipping insane so this is the actual image here i've got let me put up it on the screen so you guys can see it so this is the original Winston Churchill, Winston Churchill statue here on the right him with his iconic long coat and cane and then it's completely boarded up here 
on the left hand side so no one can touch it right because of course the previous protest kids had already you know spray painted all over it you know black lives matter called it a racist but i suppose we i saw somewhere that it's been defaced every any times if there's a there's some sort of protest in the middle of london it gets spray painted over it it is what it is and it? it's it's a it's a monument people know and love so they're going to touch it and spray paint all over it so you know these protesters come out and they're like you know what? we're going to defend the honor of this of this fucking statue and it went pretty left really really quickly as you can see by some of these tweets i'm loading up here um of course you've got this iconic image of this uh amazing gentleman of a black dude that decided to pick up and put on his shoulder a uh, member of the f i'm gonna say of the football lads who was probably causing people that look like him a bunch of trouble but in the moment of humanity in the moment of grace you know in the moment of decency he decided to essentially save this man's life um and be under no illusion this guy was probably going to die in that in that scenario but yeah some of it was just really shocking to see um there was a dude that of course urinated I'm, I'm, he might not have known let's say he didn't know but urinated on the memorial of PC Keith Palmer which is you know incredibly disgusting for anybody that was there and then you got videos like this absolute psycho hear him out this is from your time the, so I um, just want to ask why you're here today this is from the Slough you can understand why he says this. this is from the Slough for Europe uh, Twitter profile no respect to our memorials and protect them from thugs that have no respect for this country whatsoever. So you're, you're just here just to protect the war memorials? The memorials and protect our dignity and our respect. We're not here for trouble or to cause trouble. We're here on a peaceful demonstration to prove our loyalty to this country. I think a bunch of, um, f you know, f a, bunch of form a bunch of former, you know, army soldier a former a, yeah, a bunch of former soldiers mixed in with some football hooligans um who specifically go out for a tear up anyway i i guess that's a recipe for confrontation you're not gonna you know there's no way you can go out not looking for trouble if you surround yourselves with you know patriotic um ex-soldiers who have an affinity to the flag that's you know nearing insidious and also football hooligans who you know by their MO, by the main modus operandi is getting into fights. It's hard, very hard to do that, to have those two people in the same group going to defend statues that just happen to be, that happen to have come under attack by black people and you not think you're going to get into some kind of tear up in it. It's grossly naive. And what do you make of um, the Mayor of London, Sadiq Khan? Sadiq Khan said should be arrested and shot as a terrorist calling us thugs and we've served our country. That's insane, right? Um, we don't know. Most Londoners aren't fans of Sadiq Khan. Uh, he's a meek, sort of hands-offish, um, namaste, uh, you know, whatever will be, will be attitude to governing isn't the best thing for London or for the UK. Um, if ever there was a politician that was a little bit of a... You know, if ever there was a politician that was missing in action, Sadiq Khan is the antithesis of it. Um, strays away from you really addressing the hard issues. Doesn't really have a position on anything for the most part. Um, you know, is a fan of you know, um, is a fan of pushing out tropes and you know, easy sound bites that's going to appease people, but doesn't necessarily. He's you know, he's big on the fluff and less on the action. No one's no one in London is a big fan of Sadiq Khan, but to label him a terrorist is it's a bit much and we know why he's labeling him a terrorist right if Sadiq Khan was named Edward Johnson he won't be called a terrorist we know why he's calling him a terrorist all these years and there are many people here that, that have served their country and many that are dead serving this country that man is an out and out traitor um, he actually referred to everyone here today as, as far right do you see yourself as far right we are not far right we are veterans of the British Army we serve our Queen and our country, and even though we're not in full service, we still do it today. And we only kneel to the fallen. Thank you very much for your time. You're welcome. Your time, sir. Well, um, you, we, knew, we know exactly where he's coming from. And then, of course, we've got some of the best bits, uh, the fights and the scuffles that people got involved in. Let me see if I can find them here. That's the actual legend that saved the guy's life. Let's see it. So that's the picture in full colour. Here's another one. Boom, boom, boom. Look at these guys. Monkeys, right there. He's calling us a monkey. Look at the world come out. Look 
The interesting part about this, right? So there's these guys on the, up up on a platform somewhere, I guess, directing abuse at some of the black kids down below, and some of them are um, what looks to be some of them are, look, are, are doing monkey chants, which you know you can quite clearly see the guy here on the radius, obviously uh, doing some sort of monkey chants and insult to a black dude downstairs, and it makes you think, in it, a lot of those guys that were at these protests were wearing you know England tops and stuff, right? Um, from yesteryears and you know purporting to be fans of London based football clubs um, number one it's distressing be and it's distressing but also a bit of a, uh, a reminder as to why I don't support West Ham yeah, I get that a lot from some people when they find out I support my United even though United have their own problems as well up there don't get me wrong but growing up in East London and being subjected to racial abuse was you know quite normal for me growing up especially when you play football um, it was a kind of it was a common go to insult for some white kids or some white men, especially when you played with them when they just couldn't get when they couldn't get near you, right? When they felt as if like you were fucking crushing them or embarrassing them or your team was winning. The last insult they could do to kind of take you off your game was to kind of throw racial insults at you. Sometimes it'll be just to kind of in again in the spirit of the moment because they just want to take you off your game and make you distracted. Oftentimes it'll be because they did harbour some racial biases towards you, right? And it was always kind of like an exercise in self-control whenever you went to play football. And I'm sure a few people would understand this as well when you go play Sunday league or men's football or adult, yeah, men's football on a Saturday afternoon as well. You, it was just a constant barrage of that sort of shit. They'd whisper stuff to you at the corner flag. You get angry, go to the ref. By the time you turn around, they scored a goal. Loads of really mad shit like that. Innit? Um, but I'd wonder in this current era, right, with the current football players we have at the moment in the Prem being very socially aware, being, you know, glued on social media, um, being aware of their role within the community of black people. If that sounds a bit naff, please ap I apologize for it. But you know what I mean? Like they're a bit more clued up, right? People like Raheem Sterling and stuff, they've got their head screwed on right. I wonder what they would say when they see images like this, right? People that would be supporting them and screaming their name when they score a hat trick. Uh, for England in the Euros or the World Cup are also the same people that would be quick to call them a monkey when they miss a couple of chances in front of goal, right? Um, I wonder how them how that must make them feel because they have to put that shirt on, right? And these guys are donning these England shirts, but they're also, you know, going out of their way to essentially tell them that they're subhuman, right? That they're only good, they're only they're only worth cheering for when they do something. Um, positive for the badge apart from that they wouldn't spit on you with your own fire it's really distressing to see to be honest but for me it's not surprising if you have if, if you've ever been to a football ground um if you ever played football if you've ever, ever been around these people where after a game you know when they've gone to watch whether when they've gone to watch specifically west ham millwall these kind of clubs you know you know the kind of stuff they talk about and you, you just look at west ham look at the area that it's in look at the kids that play for the youth team it really is beyond belief how you could have any sort of racial um biases in you at all if you support a team like that it doesn't make any sense but what do i know especially when you consider where west ham's the old stadium used to be in upton park it's like bizarre let's continue here let's see if i can find some more of course you've got another image of the protesters the kids came to, to defend it. I don't know what this image is. Uh, but yeah, just a complete horror show in general. That's that's basically it. a complete horror show. <coughs> images of, of them throwing projectiles at people. And for the most part, the media coverage, of course, has been, you know, abhorrent. You know, they've kind of covered it and made the seem as if it was like a small minority of people when, in fact, it was probably the vast majority of these protesters weren't there to, you know, mobilise uh, without violence. They were obviously there to antagonise the Black Lives Matter supporters, get into some sort of scrap and make it on the news. That's what they actually probably wanted. And instead, the news is covering it as if, like, it was just some, you know, a fringe minority of people that were going out and causing trouble. Look at that, flares everywhere, fireworks. Look at these guys. Look at and I'm assuming there's a, you know, a couple of lions, a couple of stellas in them, feeling brave. Videos from the other week. 
more fights and tear ups. Absolutely madness. Honestly, the fight bit that was one of the, my favorite bits here, actually. Seeing them get absolutely banged is my first bit, and then seeing white supremacists get beaten up is super funny. Well, you wouldn't white supremacists, well, whatever you'd call them. Um, for people that are not fans of, you know, people that don't look like them, whoever that word is, look at this guy getting stomped out on the floor. That's an epic picture, isn't it? Epic, epic picture. I'm glad as well. The other thing I'm glad about is that so far I've not seen any use of knives being used. I guess these kids are a bit more smarter. Um, not to do that because, you know, the whole Central London was teeming with police officers. It's not pretty smart to have a knife on you. So people are just getting good old beatings, you know. If you go there and you chat shit, you get banged. As Jamie Vardy once eloquently said, another dude here again, absolutely washed. That's the thing I don't understand as well, a lot of these dudes. They're very... They're very up for confrontations, I guess in groups, but then when it comes, uh, maybe in their defense, there is about four or five black boys around them surrounding them, trying to beat them up, but there's so much so for violence, but they can't actually fight, you know? There's not, there's no bit of athleticism in this guy, right, from both of them. This one's cold up on the floor like a baby. This one's knee is giving way, and he's doing a little bit of a break dance move here on the floor. They're not necessarily, you know, they're not the best at <laughs> throwing hands per se. Another one got his face absolutely washed. Look at that face here, smushed by the fist, which probably led to the breakdown move here we see on the second picture. Just really, really pathetic, man. If you're gonna go out there and try and fight young kids, at least be on your, you know, be in, be in your thing. This is a fa this is a really epic one. You got this white dude here in a pair of red trainers with no top on and a pair of shorts, you know, perfect wear for this, you know, hot summer's day in London. If you look across, everyone else is wearing jackets and jumpers, but you know, this guy feels the heat at the moment, takes it off, rocks up to probably the b fair play to him, right? Because he rocks up to one of the biggest black dudes that's in that crew. Yeah, this guy looks, you know, looks like he can take care of himself. He rocks up, he's got his hands up, right? He's, mo he's moving over to the white dude in, in a stance that would lead, lead you to believe that he might have some bits of training in him. But the white dude has got that, you know, he's got that, he's got that bump, couple bumps of cat courage and maybe a stellar or two in him and he's feeling brave. So he thinks, you know what, fuck this, I'm going to go for it. They get some sort of exchange, he's backing him up, he's saying, come on, come on, he's egging him on, he's teasing him and then boom, overhead right to the temple, right on the floor. Rewind, look at that. It's really dangerous though, because I'm not really a fan of people fighting on concrete. Because when you hit your head hits the floor, that's a concussion. You know, full stop. You you could be out for a long, 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 long time. You could potentially die. But in this instance, he dies. He dies, isn't it? Look at that. God damn it. That was a hit. And of course, everyone laughing and smiling. A guy in the background taking a picture of him. Jesus Christus, that was sweet. And then let's do one more. Uh, of course, you got Pretty Patel here telling everybody that they were f a, sm a small minority of thugs. As have the police around the country and in London, that these protests, these gatherings are illegal and we have been discouraging them. Secondly... A little discouraging pro... We're so, such a British thing to do, a discouraging protest. Okay, cool. That's going to work. We have seen a small minority behave in extreme thuggery and... <laughs> Anyway, this is the best one, right? This guy got absolutely washed. He got fair play, right? It's his fault in, to begin with. Never get separated from your crew. If you're gonna go out and be racist and you're gonna go harangue and antagonize a bunch of really fit young black kids who are out there protesting and some of them also looking for a bit of trouble, the least you can do is not to get separated from your crew if you're gonna do it right. If I'm gonna give a note out to all them, all my um, all my football hooligans out there, try not to get separated from your mates, Dave, Andy, Tom, Darren, and whoever else his name is, Jack, right? Try and keep close to those guys because once you get separated, there's no telling what's gonna happen to you. Look at that, he gets separated, he's getting kicks to the head, he's trying to stay on his feet and he just succumbs to the beating, gets piled upon, kicks to the midriff, kicks to the head. Is the same dude? I think that might be, yeah, it's the same dude, same place. They separate, push everyone out and he kind of in a drunken days steps up. Look at his face. He is absolutely, he doesn't even know where he is probably, right? Covered in blood, 
wearing the quintessential European shoe too, the quintessential shoe from the UK, the Air Max 90, with a pair of grey jogging bottoms and a navy top, and he's absolutely covered in blood. That's insane. <laughs> Police, I don't know who they're chasing here. They're chasing somebody. Probably a bunch of kids trying to push them out of the area. Loads of black power masks. They're putting a cordon around the area. They're stomping at another dude here on the floor. Jesus Christ. Another flare goes off. <laughs> Absolute mental shit going on in London right now. Actually, you know what? Let's go back a bit. That these women sitting here on the sitting here to the right. Do you think they had any idea there was protests going on? They just went, or they just happened to be in London eating a sandwich while this thing's kicking off. What do you think happened? The ones that are just there on the right, lady here on the right wearing yellow. Do you think she had any idea that they were protesting in London? Or she just happened to be so oblivious to what was going on in the world, decided to rock up to central London, you know, take her little sandwich she made with her at home, a little bottle of Oasis, and just sit there listening to her album and what people watch, you know, or watch the birds. And then suddenly she's just in the middle of this uh, race war <laughs> in the middle of London. Fucking crazy, isn't it? It's absolutely nuts, man. Pick up all the kids out there doing the, doing the fair, fight in the fair fight, man. Took him down well, innit? Well done, this. Well done, dismantling. Boom! I like the dismantling. Yeah. Don't you do that again, all right? Nice. They close the station. They're trying to push through the police there on the platform. Madness, absolute madness, man. But yeah, it all got sorted out in the end, didn't it? But yeah, crazy, crazy scenes out there in London. Crazy, crazy scenes. Anyway, let's move on. And next on the docket, let's talk about Vogue and Condé Nast. Condé Nast and Vogue, Vogue and Condé Nast. So, there's been interesting things going on at the moment, right? Mostly spurred by the events that happen at Con. Well, mostly spurred by the events that happen at Bon Appetit, as you've been uh, probably aware if you've been keeping up with the news. Bon Appetit have been have gone through a little bit of drama over the last couple of days. Um, I guess the news kind of well it kind of all started because somebody leaked an image of Adam Rappaport who is sort of like the head editor-in-chief of Bon Appetit and also the person responsible I guess for pushing them towards um, digital video sort of stuff away from the magazine and then that's become one of the biggest cash cows within the Condé Nast empire Bon Appetit is owned by Condé Nast one of um, bon Condé Nast's um, bits of media that they own out there he does a really good thing he pushes the video there i watch a lot of the bon appetit videos it's you know they can be a bit cringe some of the personalities are you know incredibly up themselves but once you get past all the hipster um you know fronting and shoving and showing off and shit it is pretty good show you know they they have some pretty good recipes i uh, like the personalities um the videos are produced really well bloody blah 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 a, vi a clip comes a clip is leaked <coughs> a clip is leaked by a disgruntled employee showing Adam Rappaport dressed up in brown face I guess he kind of him and his girlfriend at the time who also happens to be his wife now I assume um, I wonder how that relationship is surviving bloody hell um, they have, they wanted to dress up as Latinos or whatever it may be back in the day as a Halloween get up and of course um, by these by today's standards it's not it's not acceptable that picture goes around it prompts an apology which then prompts a meeting which then prompts Adam Rappaport um, resigning from his position that looks like that's the base of the story right but that's not it obviously there's more layers to the story which I'll talk about later but that was sort of like the first thing the first chink in the armour and the Condé Nast kind of armour that sort of made people ask questions as to why there is an apparent lack of diversity when it comes to Condé Nast and all things you know all things Vogue um, anecdotal evidence on my side would be we have this place in the centre of London called Vogue House, right, where essentially Vogue is located. And I've been there a couple of times. I've also known people that have worked there and I've also just been around there, you know, um, I don't know, cycling, hanging around, doing whatever I do. And I remember specifically this one occasion where I happened to come, where I happened to be around Vogue House when they had a fire alarm or a fire drill. And I remember seeing like hordes of white girls come out. First of all, I was like, oh shit, there's a whole lot of hot girls I work there. But then I remember being on my bike, just sitting there, watching everyone come out of the office, thinking to myself, wow, 
there's a lot of white people work at Vogue, innit? Like, it's just, it was just like, an, and again, I'm not that person to be like, you know, wanting to see quotas or, you know, equal gender distribution, in, equal gender representation seen in all companies. I don't think that's something to, uh, that's, you can aim for, right? I think people should be rewarded for the skills that they, for the things that they can bring to the company or for the experience and skills and not you know, based on what's in between their legs. Once you get into that area, it just becomes a bit crazy. So I'm not even a fan of that sort of um, ideology. But it just was just from an observing point of view, just, you know, because I've got eyes. It was just really funny to see that, oh, it's interesting that a magazine that purports to be the voice of fashion, right, that happens to be in one of the most multicultural cities in the world, um, happens to have uh, an employee roster of it's mostly made up of white girls and it's not even like they're only just white they're the same kind of white person right uh, fairly affluent middle class you know university graduate university educated level people like this is a particular look about them right the kind of girls that wear those really colorful uh, platform heels that they sell in top shop and maybe a designer bag or jacket and shit um, you know, they kind of have that, you know, it's either boho look, they had not have that kind of, what's that, Alexa Chung look or something. Like, there's a particular look of those girls that work in Vogue House. They're very, you know, they're very cookie cutter. So I was like, oh, interesting. But I kept that as anecdotal evidence. But I'm also aware that fashion is weird like that, whereas, you know, it's one of those, um, it's one of those places where nepotism is ripe, right? So in some cases, I wouldn't be quick to label it a racist industry. I'd say it's probably, you know, uh, it's probably fraught with nepotism more so than it is with racism, right? Where people are more likely to get their friends a job who does who who don't have any experience working in the industry as opposed to bringing in people who are underrepresented or people who are kind of on the margins. They'd much rather to bring their friend in. I know from just you know anecdotal evidence that I've seen loads of girls that I've known in the scene especially in the fashion world who have kind of got their start working in fashion just from being a door girl somewhere, right? Some one of their friends owns a fashion store or works for a particular fashion brand. They want someone cool and hot to do the door, to do the guest list when there's an event. So they get their friend to go do it. They, she does it. She has no interest in fashion whatsoever. And then through just standing there and looking pretty, you get put in a position where you might be end up being, you know, an editorial assistant or you might end up just being a runner in the studio somewhere for a showroom that then leads you to give your foot in the industry which then leads to other things so i know that's a real big issue um but i also know just from just the kind of optic standard point of view it probably is beneficial for a company like for a magazine like vogue especially nowadays with the magazine sales dwindling to have some level of representation so that they can hit different markets just so they can stay afloat just from a purely business point of view it makes more sense so based off the back of the Condé Nast drama involving Bien Buen Appetit, people started asking questions about what Anna Wintour was doing. And I guess this came about via some quotes attributed to Naomi Campbell about how she was treated during her time at Vogue under the stewardship of Anna Wintour. The fact that Anna Wintour you know, is getting a bit old and long in the teeth and maybe there needs to be a bit of a change and she's not very receptive to kind of I guess stepping aside, which is unfair. I think asking anyone to step aside in an industry like fashion, which is quintessentially, you know, I guess working in fashion and music, are, if you're a creative, they're probably two of the most, um, uh, would not aspiration, they're probably two of the most coveted positions that you want to work in, right? There, it's the quintessential dream job no one working in those roles would uh, willingly give up their position because no one getting a job in fashion or in music is really hard right the odds are really stacked against you so once you do get your way in once you do get a position in there regardless if you get it via nepotism or you get it just based on your talent you're not going to be quick to um pass it along or pass it down to somebody else coming up you're gonna you know you're gonna want to basically die on the showroom floor which is you know your prerogative you can do as you please um but i think the lack of even having a conversation regarding the changing of guard is probably the most concerning part so this um, article from new york times essentially details what's actually happening at Condé Nast and what the future holds for anna winter um, and it has some very interesting troubling bits as well, which kind of make me think um, there's going to be some changes sooner rather than later in that um, building regardless. So this is the following. This is from um, New York Times. It says, I reckon at Condé Nast, uh, it's written by Edmund Lee. It says the following. It says, it was supposed to be Condé Nast's year. 
the publisher of Vogue, Vanity Fair and the New Yorker was going to be profitable again after years of layoffs and losses. Then advertising revenue suddenly dropped as the coronavirus pandemic created the economy. More recently, as protests against racism and police violence grew into the worldwide momentum, company employees publicly complained about racism at the workplace and some in less content. In response, the two leaders of the nearly all-white executive team, the artistic director Anna Wintour and the chief executive Roger Lynch, offered apologies to the staff. At an all-hands um, online meeting on Friday, employees asked Miss Wintour, the top editor of Vogue since 1988. God almighty. She, she's holding on to that oh, tight in it not letting that one go and the company's editorial leader since 2013 would be leaving mr lynch the communications chief daniel kerrig shot down the question saying miss winter was not going anywhere and said three people who attended the meeting but were not authorized to discuss it publicly there she is in a trademark bob and massive glasses uh Tormut has Tormut has hit Condé Nast a company built partly on selling a glossy brand of elitism to the masses at a time when its financial outlook is grim last year the US division lost approximately 100 million dollars on about 900 million in revenue said several people with knowledge of the company who were not authorized to speak publicly the European arm has also had losses Mr Lynch said in an interview on Friday that he was not familiar with the cited figure citing the company's merger of its domestic intestinal operations part of recent restructuring had been costly of course is not familiar with it and if there's one thing you can count on um in the fashion industry is rumors and leaks of information uh, people love to gossip in fashion people love to share information so if this is out there it's definitely there's definitely some truth to it it continues it says in april the company institu uh, instituted pay cuts for anyone making over a hundred thousand and then came layoffs a hundred jobs are gone out of roughly six thousand which is pretty good considering magazines are dead right that they were able to they only had to let go of you know 100 people right that's less than what less than 10 percent, right that's amazing that's not less than 10 percent. yeah it is less than 10 percent is right um that's really good um the fact that they institute pay cuts for anyone making 100 grand is neither here or there i don't think there's probably there's not many people in that company that are making 100 grand i think that really do the work um Maybe it's mostly just the executive branch, I'd assume. It continues here. It says, Condé Nast is one of the main many media organizations, including the New York Times, whose employees have questioned companies' leaders as people around the world have taken part in protests prompting by the killing of George Floyd, a black man who died last month in Minneapolis after a white police officer pinned him to the ground with his knee. This, this is the most concerning part for me. All these bits of change, all these bits of, you know, the change that's been brought about in various industries has solely come off the back of some random guy in Minneapolis dying at the hands of police officers. Like it's both distressing and also um, it fills you with some kind of hope for humanity, right? The fact that seeing this guy's life get snuffed out in front of you has essentially made people question their position, question their privilege, uh, question the lack of representation in the industry that they work in. Is really encouraging but it's also quite upsetting to think that it had to take this right it, it wasn't enough for people's accounts it wasn't enough for people's stories to be shared and all that stuff and complaints to be raised by hr that wasn't enough it had to take some guy dying you know thousands of miles away from where you live for people to suddenly start looking at themselves in the mirror and thinking what am i doing to change things for the better you know it's really really troubling um, it continues, says the company has been led by the Newhouse family since 1959. Stephen Newhouse has the parent company, Advance, and his cousin, Jonathan Newhouse, is the chairman of Condé Nast Board. Advance also controls more than 40 newspapers and news sites across the country. Many of them, including a plain dealer of Cleveland and the Star Ledger of New York, have struggled. The Newhouse family have protected itself against lots of significant investments in the cable giant charter and immediate conglomerate discovery. That could probably be a conversation for another day because I guess everyone's so busy waiting, you know, trying to get reparations through jobs. But that's a real conversation, right? If you want to, if we want to have uh, black people, if we want to have some level of political and economical power, we have to educate the younger kids coming up or even people in position now to invest in, you know, I don't know, to invest in stuff like this, right? To have a position where you are, you have a quasi monopoly on a certain industry that gives you the, 
the basically the leverage to do as you please with your company um i'm pretty sure that new house family if they have a daughter or a son who wants to intern at vogue or intern at vanity fair or the new yorker for sure they can get them in straight away and that's what we need more so in a black culture as opposed to just having a black chief executive or a black uh, creative director we need somebody that's actually pulling the strings behind the scenes advocating for you know people from you know minority communities and giving them a voice that's the most important thing and that really starts from the business people putting their money where their money where their mouth is and actually buying up these media companies in order to represent said culture in them that's probably the most important thing you know it's all well and good having a job and having a great nice title and you know a bit of nice bit of cardboard in your back pocket in terms of a business card but the real influence the real power comes from operating in the background pulling the strings and being part of these big media conglomerates at the new house family it continues here it says before the internet took readers away from print Condé Nast was known for its thick magazines edited by cultural arbiters who traveled in the same circles as the people they covered as digital media rose Condé Nast was slow to adapt very much true do you remember during the whole street style era how slow they adapt to that one and also during just the influencer stage they were kind of you know they poo-pooed influencers for such a long time so part of me is sort of happy they're struggling but also you know it's a fashion institution without vogue you know fashion will be in a worse a worse place without vogue you know we just it needs a reform but it doesn't need we don't need it to die um so to that by just tie magazines including gourmet mademoiselle and details folded of course yeah Mamazo is a good one actually. It continues. It says by the time Mr. Lynch, a former head of music streaming service Pandora, this is where it comes. This is where you see the white privilege, right? Mr. Lynch is the chief operate, chief operating executive of Condé Nast, and look at his experience. Mr. Lynch, a former head of music streaming service Pandora, right, which is you know terrible, right, succeeded Robert A. Salberger as chief executive last year. Condé Nast was in a triage mode. After his arrival, he it unloaded three publications, uh, Brides, Golf Digest, and W. On Monday, so that's where he's got experience from, from being a, you know, a former head of music streaming at Pandora is now the head of Condé Nast. It's like, God, uh. anyway, it says, on Monday, Condé Nast reckoned with how the company deals with issues related to race. Ad Rappaport, a long-time top editor, Bon Appetit, resigned after a photo surfaced on social media showing him in a costume that stereotypically depicted Puerto Rican dress. Um, he apologized to staff members in the video conference. After the report left the call, the staff voiced complaints about the Bonaparte workplace. Some minority employees said they had been used as ethnic props in Bonaparte videos, a growing segment of Condé Nast business. Trust me, I've been there. I've been accosted and taken to meetings purport, you know, under the guise that I was going to have really big input in the meeting, but they were just using me as a racial prop, right? Um, I'm very opinionated, as you know, listen to the podcast. Um I'd love to hear myself speak as you listen, as you are um, witness to um, hear me speak on this podcast. So you can only imagine, you know, what taking me to an interview full of, you know, uh, venture capitalists is going to end up like, right? I'm going to go in there and try and wow the room. And it's only after you finish, the, after the fact, when you leave, you're like, hold on, number one, I didn't get compensated for it. You know, if they, um, if they manage to secure a $10 million deal, I don't get any sort of, you know, fee for my performance let's say and then secondly the only reason why i was there is because i was black yeah it was i wasn't necessarily there for my intellect the intellect happened to be a bit of a bonus but the main reason is because i happened to represent um some sort of reflection of diversity uh and it continues um it says here uh, it's so hard to be a person of color this company said ryan walter walker hartshaw Sorry, Ryan Walker Hart Sean, a black woman who worked at assistant as admin at Rappaport. She said, my blood is still boiling. There's been a lot of that this week, isn't it? People with blood boiling, people being frustrated, people being tired. Um, she recalled a 2018 meeting of editors to discuss how to make the magazine's Instagram account more diverse. Imagine, this is just the Instagram account. Look how they handle this one. In a room of about eight editors, three people were color. She said, and we're all very junior, no power, Miss Walker Hudson said in a Heart Sean said sorry interview. I was like, You're asking us how to make our Instagram black without hiring more black people, which is, you know, one of the main problems. And you I see that a lot with companies I've worked for in startup meetings where um the executive branch have or the exec the people that are a bit, you know, higher up in the chain, they have they do that thing where they know anything where they ask for your opinion in a room full of, you know, subordinates. They don't necessarily listen to their opinion 
and then when you re- when you when you kind of raise any kind of reservation the common thing they say is oh stop being so negative right when you kind of shoot down an idea they say that's not good and then they say oh what's your idea it's like no you know you didn't bring me in here to for me to voice my opinions you brought me in here to uh, affirm yours so forgive me for not being in idea mode at the moment but then when you do give them an idea they just completely dismiss it anyway so as meetings become really useless and i think i've learned the hard way because i remember i used to be the person that would always give my opinion and put my hand up and fight during meetings then i realized that this is pointless i'm just causing division within the team i'm making it seem as if i don't like being here i'm making these people not like me right because because they're not gonna listen to what i have to say because they've made their mind up already you know for better or for worse so you're better off just shutting up and letting them do as they please it continues and of course if you don't like it the best thing to do is just go and set up your own company and there's nothing you can do to push people in the direction where they don't want to go in um it continues it says here at company forum on tuesday mr lynch said bon appetit employees should have raised their concerns earlier and i bet you they did but they weren't listened to so that's a completely ridiculous suggestion to make a comment that rubbed many the wrong way of course it would in a closed uh, door session later that day he apologized to a group of staff members who had pushed for members out sir because it's these things are never just that's the thing that i think the higher ups don't know it's basically maybe because they're not in the office day to day but when you have a toxic environment it's really not something that comes out of the blue it's something that sort of festers over a long period of time right and through fear of repercussions or whatever it may be you don't say anything that creates a toxic environment because that means there's three or four people that go away in secret and gossip about certain individuals it just creates loads of friction so when it kind of comes to a head don't think that this is the first time it's being raised because for sure there's people in the team who are less worried about public less worried about you know um, reprisals who would be willing to go up to someone in HR or to speak to somebody else another team in confidence that and if there's one thing you know about working in an office you know rumors and gossip travel quickly right people love a bit of Chinese whispers at the coffee machine so things will get out there people will tell people things about what's going on in um, in the team so it's 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 never really an isolated incident it's always a culmination a compounding effect of instances that kind of blow up and then suddenly the you know the people hire up are like oh my god I didn't know this was happening you should have told me earlier it's like bitch we told you earlier you just weren't listening um continues says um, i want you to know i take this personally and i take personal responsibility for it he said according to audio recording um the one-time banker at morgan stanley right this is his experience and he's the head one of the heads at Condé Nast, a one-time banker of Morgan Stanley, Mr. Lynn spent much of his career at Dish, a satellite TV service. As a hobby, he played lead guitar in a classic rock band, The Merger. He moved to San Francisco, not New York, and updated his wardrobe to join Condé Nast. So imagine being somebody that's been working in streaming services and just a general, you know, an executive, you know, mediocre executive for that regard. That's the height of white privilege, right? Being able to step you step in to Condé Nast and call the shots to any meaningful regard is really, really ridiculous. It, Mr. Lynch says, has emphasized diversity efforts and environmental programs and emails to staff. He said in an interview on Friday that he has developed an overall company strategy as he assembled executive team. In December, he hired, uh, how do you pronounce her name? Deirdre? Deirdre Findlay as chief executive executive market officer making her the company's highest ranking black executive okay well done that one i'll give you a credit on there his former executive assistant cassie jones who is black quit <laughs> shortly after he gave her the gift she considered insulting three people with knowledge of the matter said <laughs> this story is mad right in november after she had spent four months working for him mr lynch called miss jones into his office and handed her the elements of style a guide to standard english usage by william struck and eb white mr mr lynch said he thought he she should she could benefit from it like how patronizing now it could be said it could just be an innocent gift right but to give somebody a book that's what is an elocution right or book or some regard um to somebody of color uh in an industry like fashion you, you can't help but the the recipient cassie jones she's been a right to read into that right because everything in fashion you have to read into right nothing is just done for show everything is done as a nod to something so for him to give her this book is incredibly tone deaf number one if it's just a mistake and also it's so rude but it's not it's no surprise really right this guy is not even from the fashion world he's been in it for about five years or so and he's already acclimatized to the bitchy catchy catty nature of the industry coming from satellite world right coming from working in a you know highbrow office somewhere he suddenly slipped into that mode of being a catty piece of shit mad isn't it 
It says, um, with suggestion that her own language skills were lacking, the gift struck Miss Jones as a microaggression that people said. A few days later, she quit. Before leaving the headquarters at One World Trade Tower in Lower Manhattan, she placed the book on his desk. <laughs> I thought that's a really good microaggression back actually to be fair microaggressions are fucking stupid but if you're gonna do it that's really good that's super passive aggressive Mr. Lin said that he hadn't meant to insult Miss Jones who declined to comment on this article he says I really only had one intention like every time I've given it before for it to be a helpful resource as it's been for me I still use it today I'm really sorry if it's interpreted that way but that's stupid because imagine if his book of choice to give people was um, seven ways to grow rich or something right and he happened to give it and he happened to give it to his assistant who everyone knows is paid pittance right that would be also uh it's a good book to give somebody but that's also a book that's you know that'd also be incredibly rude you'd also have to take that the wrong way right this guy is essentially you know thumbing his nose in my face by giving me a gift that purports to be seven steps to get rich and he's paying me i don't know five pound an hour that wouldn't be on either so again the lack of uh, <laughs> The lack of emotional intelligence is really low in it in these kind of places. I had no idea there was an issue. I didn't know. I didn't know. I didn't know. Like, bloody hell. These guys aren't going to survive, I don't think. Um, before Lynch's arrival, David Remenick, the editor in chief of the New York, objected to a plan that would lower the magazine description price and raise the rates. He was brought aboard. He was brought aboard a diverse crew journalist, including Gia Tolentino, Hugh Sue, Vincent. Cunningham while adding digital descriptions. Three people with knowledge of the company said a New Yorker was likely to pass Vogue as Cunningham. That's the biggest contributor to the US profits. Oh, I didn't know that. Okay. People added that about 80% of the New Yorker's revenue came from readers, which helped the magazine weather the advertising downturn. But this is one that I want to see here. Then. Da, 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 da. On June 4th, Mr. Winter sent a project note to Vogue staff saying, I want to say, especially to the black members of the team, how, of them, out of five i can't imagine what these days have been like miss winter said i want to say plainly that i know Vogue has not found enough ways to elevate the gift space of black editors and writers and photographers designers and other creators as a lot of people you've missed out on we have made mistakes to publishing images of stories that have been hurtful and in intolerant i take full responsibility for mistakes the british born miss winter has been credited internationally as championing relika jones one of the few top editors of color the company's history miss jones a former editor director of the book department at the times who took over vanity fair from grader carter in 2017 changed the magazine identity this is the bit that really is gonna i think this woman won't survive let's continue here um not um Rashida jones but the other one let's see so the first cover subject she chose for the april 2018 issue was the actress and producer lena waif a black woman photographed photographed by anna Leibovitz in a plain white t-shirt uh later covers covered michelle michael b jordan janelle monet and limano miranda miss jones has put out 16 vanity covers featuring black people of color sorry when miss jones arrived she was pillared by fashion insiders who questioned her style sense imagine imagine these fucking run-of-the-mill um floral wearing uh ditzy white women from labrick grove questioning the personal style of somebody like rashida jones like imagine right <sighs> um her choice of legwear tights with illustrated foxes drew stares according to a report in women's daily miss winter later showed her a support for miss jones at the welcome party by handing out gifts tights with foxes on them nice little uh, nod there right there she is radica jones doing her thing looking nice and pretty um at a quarterly meeting of the company executives in 2019 on mr lynch's second day at Condé Nast, miss jones presented her plan for vanity fairs issues a prime landing spot for fashion and, and luxury advertisers from september to december last year da, 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 right two executives criticized miss jones plan this, these, this woman will survive according to three people who were at the meeting in particular suzanne plag plague plagueman Suzanne Plagman, the chief business executive officer of Condé Nast Style Division, challenged Miss Jones at length, saying the plan would be difficult to sell to advertisers. To diffuse this attention, Miss Winter banged her fist on the table and said, we need to move on, according to three people uh, who were at the meeting. It, it reminds me of the meetings I used to have at startups where they had like a flat hierarchy. 
which is good because everyone gets a voice, but it's bad because no decisions are getting made, right? And you go around in circles. So that's a really funny <laughs> note to hear. Miss Plagman, who is white, joined the company in 2010 as Vogue's chief business officer and worked closely with Mr. Pintor. In 2018, she elevated her current job. Um, three people with knowledge of the matter said she was a vocal about her negative view of Vanity Fair under its new editor. I wonder why, hmm? Um, she had criticised Miss Jones' choices of cover subjects, telling others at the company that the magazine would feature more people that look like us. <sighs> Imagine being working in a magazine and being afraid or being annoyed that somebody is featuring people in magazines that don't look like you for a change. You've been in magazines since magazines were in, fucking invented and now you're getting annoyed. <sighs> Um, a third person said that he had heard her use the words expressing a similar sentiment. All the people said that they interpreted the phrase and similar remarks as referring to well-off white people, white women, sorry, who adopt an aesthetic common among the fashion set, you know, those people that have like, you know, cottages and houses in the Hamptons and all that sort of naff stuff. Now, through a condom our spokesman, Miss Plagman denied making those statements and denied expressing a dim view of Miss Jones' vanity fair. In an interview on Friday, Miss Lynch addressed Miss Jones' stewardship of the magazine more broadly. He said the challenge with her taking a new direction will be alienating some of the traditional vanity fair audience, um, including Miss Plagman, I assume. I really applaud what she has done. But yeah, man. Um, I'll check out the whole thing. I want to read a bit of the uh, Bonavitti stuff in a later episode, but a really, really, really <laughs> infusing article from the New uh, from the New York Times about what's going on at Condé Nast and the rather reckoning happening at the moment. And you know, for sure, we're going to see changes afoot at Condé Nast for sure. Um, no one's going to survive this, as we've seen. Reparations and job market has been fraught throughout the entire process. Um, of the, you know for as a reaction to the protest in america through the death of george floyd again it's disconcerting that this is what brought about the change but maybe it's for the good going forward but yeah very funny place to be um for sure for sure for sure anna winter won't be fired she'll probably have to, probably have to leave on her own regard or she won't even she'll probably be hanging on there for dear life right once you're part of vogue for that long I don't know what else would she do, you know? It's part of her identity. She probably doesn't know what else to do outside of that job. Um, so that would be hard to kind of reconcile what she does in the next stage. But this isn't going to end well in it for all those people involved. So if you feel sorry for them, do. I don't think a lot of people do. But hey, what can you do? <laughs> it's funny, man. Imagine living in a world in 2020 where you would expect to see Anna Winter being pressured to leave her job, man. I would never have thought this would happen. Never my wildest dreams, man. Crazy, crazy, crazy times. But anyway, that's the Excellence English Show, episode number 325. Thanks so much for tuning in. As per usual, if you're watching via the YouTube channel, make sure you smash that like button. Hit subscribe. Let me know what you think of the show. If you're listening via the podcast app, of course, make sure you leave me a five-star review and share it with all your family and friends. And I'll see you guys again for another episode later on. Um, um, yeah, later on, more, more topics to talk about, more things to go through. Hopefully you have a good start of the week and you do the things that you didn't do last week, innit? That's the main thing during this lockdown. Don't get discouraged. Try and keep good habits and all that good shit. And I'll see you guys very, very soon. Take care. Be safe. Bye.